Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 12 of the Isle of Man Sport podcast. And today we have two very special guests. And I also have my fabulous co-host as well, uh, who we'll go to first, who is Mr. Paul Callow, our business administrator from Isle of Man Sport. Welcome, Paul. I think Paul's frozen. Thank you very much, Trevor. Hello, everybody. I'm glad you could come along and co-host this episode, Paul. It's the first time I've had a co-host, so hopefully if I miss any fabulous questions, you'll be uh, well in there with some gold to ask our two guests. Which brings us on to our two guests. We've got with us today our winners from the 2019 Isle of Man Sports Awards in the uh, Sportsman and Sportswoman of the Year categories. So we have uh, the, the lovely Yasmin Ingham, who's won our Sportswoman of the Year. Hello, Yaz, how are you? Hi, yeah, good, thank you. How are you? Excellent, very good, thank you. And we also have uh, Mr. Joseph Reed, who's won our Sportsman of the Year. Joe, how you doing, mate? I'm good, thanks, mate. Nice to be on. Excellent. So, uh, let's kick off then. I mean, 2019, you, you've won Sportsman, Sportswoman of the Year. Uh, it, it must f- feel absolutely fantastic to, to achieve that. Give us a bit of a, review, of a review of your 2019, what made it so special, what were your real highlights? So if you kick off with you first, Yaz? Yeah, sure, that sounds good. Um, yeah, 2019, it was a really, really good year for me. Um, my main aim was to go to the Under-25 British Championship and I thought I had a really good chance of doing well and to actually come away with the title was obviously a bit of a dream come, come true, really. So... Um, absolutely delighted to have achieved my my goal that I'd set myself um, earlier on in 2019. So really delighted with that, um, as well as the fact that I've now completed the whole set of the Youth British Championships now. So that was like my my ultimate goal was to to end up doing that. So I'm only um, I'm 23 in a couple of days, so I've got a couple more years left at the under 25s yet. So I wanted to make sure I achieved that before I turned. 25 and I was out of that category so it's nice to have done it a bit earlier than I was gonna well you know I've got a couple more years left to do it so um and then again the the second half of the year I did have a couple of speed bumps and stuff but you know that's kind of part of the sport and lots of athletes can relate to that the up and down and injuries and that's just how it goes really so um I was delighted to come out of the year being really happy with my progress and my results so yeah, yeah absolutely chuffed wow I mean to, to get that clean sweep and you're the only person to have ever done that as well uh through all those age categories and just remind us was it, was it four different age categories yes yeah it was um the under 16s under 18s under 21s and the under 25s so Crazy. yeah it's um it's a really, really amazing achievement for me. And did did I hear it right in your in your sporting interview in the sports awards interview? You you got uh, an Olympic qualification scores as well. Yeah, I was so happy to have achieved um, the three horse one of well three of the horses that I ride. A um, couple of them being Sue Davies and Jeanette Chin are qualified for the Olympics. Um, well, the qualification pro- process for the Olympics. So. It's really exciting that I can well now go out next year and try and put in some early season results and hopefully sort of be on the list that they um, whittle down to their final few combinations that actually end up going to um, Tokyo. So uh, really, really happy to have achieved that as well. So um, obviously my ultimate goal in life is to go and win a gold medal at the Olympics. So to be sort of a little bit closer now is um, really exciting. Absolutely. So, Yasmin, do you think the uh, the extra year has has been maybe a bit more advantageous to you then? Um, I would year? say um, it's almost a bit of an advantage um, with having an extra year because it means that um, I can train with the horses for an extra year and we can be sort of a bit better for next year, so a bit more experience and they'll be trained a bit better. So. I would say from my point of view, it's an advantage and I can almost um, really focus now on this time that we've got to, um, with no events going on, I'm really focusing on my weak points. So um, to try and really strengthen those up before the season starts again next year, hopefully. Excellent. I mean, 
Look, looking to you, Joe, as well. Uh, does this extension have an impact on on your planning? Uh, potentially, with the Olympics being a year later, does that make it more uh, a realistic goal for yourself to to, to look towards? Yeah, I think um, I'm probably in the same boat as Yaz, really. I'm young enough and um, in comparison to other people in my event, in my sport, that this year probably helps me. It still helps me um, grow to be a better athlete, whereas some people might have been looking at 2020 from 2014, 2015, saying, oh, if I do everything right, I'll hopefully be able to hang on to them, whereas I'm yeah. still going to be getting better past 2020 into 21 and 22. So... Yeah, the extra year from from a selfish point of view for me is quite good. Again, it means you've got extra time to work on your weaknesses, extra time to get fitter, faster, stronger. And hopefully if we can actually do some races before summer 2021 next year, you'll be that bit more experienced as well, which for a younger athlete like me will help. Absolutely. I mean, as you say there, there'll be, there'll be some people who, who are really going to, potentially miss out if they've come to the end of their career yeah. and, you know and all of a sudden they're, they're past their peak and they're going to struggle to get that, that back again so you know fantastic it's going to, hopefully going to work in, well, in your favour yeah. <laughs> being, being young and ready to act you know and get in there so I mean what, what, what were your highlights for 2019 Joe just give us a little bit of a background to, to your successes because you had a fantastic year yeah um, it was my favourite favorite year of running since i've been a kid like you know when you're a kid you just want to go out and win races and run pbs and i basically had like the senior year of doing that um it was nice as well because i took a bit of a gamble i mean 2018 i was in the isle of man um living here full time and i was working 30 hours a week at manx telecom and then i decided that i needed to go back over to the uk to really try and kick on a bit and then Thankfully, we started seeing results of that straight away. Um, I ran for England indoors um, in Vienna, front of the England team, and won my race out there, which then led on to British Champs, which, again, went really well. Um, I ended up winning that. It was, circumstances were a bit strange because the, the race itself, I actually crossed the line second but the guy who won ended up getting disqualified for mm -hmm. um i think it was a push in the end that they put it down to and i'd i'd only just picked the other guy for second and at the time yeah. i was dead happy i thought our oh, top two will qualify for europeans as long as you got the standard so i was just happy that i'd qualified and then we were waiting for the medal presentation <laughs> and this woman came over and she whispered in my ear she's like oh i think that you might have won and i was like <laughs> what <laughs> he was like yeah um the guy who won might have been disqualified, so then I had to wait. It ended up being like four hours to get the result, and then found out I won. Got a lane in the Grand Prix, qualified for Europeans, went there, made the semi final, which I was chuffed about. Um, and then outdoors, I ran like four four PBs, um, won the England title in July um, outright this time, no, disqualif <laughs> no disqualifications. <laughs> Um, and then British final outdoors as well, which is probably, it's got to be the best British final that we've had in years. I mean, everyone in that race is like top, top quality athlete. And yeah. it's great to be, great to be in that. And I just came out of the year feeling like that I've had my kind of breakthrough year now and I'm ready to kick on over the next two or three years mm -hmm. and really establish myself as one of the top senior Britons in 800 metres. That's fantastic. I mean, you, both of you have, have been experiencing some really high-level competition there. And, I mean, I suppose it makes, begs the question about mindset, doesn't it? I mean, ha, a lot of people could go into those situations and feel quite uh, daunted, uh, scared, and, and, and possibly a little bit intimidated to actually pr produce their best performances. I mean, ha, how do you guys approach those big competitions? For me... Um, I, it was something that I probably struggled with when I was younger. I I used to always think that, you know, because we're from little old Isle of Man and I'm competing against guys who have got all the training facilities in the world in London and access to the best coaches and stuff, I always used to think that they had an advantage. But I always like to just strip it down to the basics and just think, you know, for me, it's 
man against man, like I was in primary school when I was have cross country or sports day. It's just whoever can get to the line the fastest. Doesn't matter what experience or what access you've got. If you back yourself and believe in yourself enough, then you can beat anyone. And I think as I've come to be a senior, I've thought about that more, and it, it's definitely helped me to be less intimidated by other athletes who you might see as superior to you. But really, like I said, it's just man on man. You've got to get to the line first. Absolutely. And, uh, and you guys, I mean, you've got the unique scenario as well of it's not only what you do, but it's, it's also the, the animal that, you, <laughs> that you're riding as well. You know, how, how does that sort of impact in the world of horse riding? Because if a horse comes from good breeding, I suppose that could put, uh, some people might think one horse is guaranteed to be better than another because of its, uh, its genetics. Yeah, I mean, for sure, like the genetics definitely help. Um, if you've bred a horse that's kind of got talented parents, then, you know, that's a good chance that the outcome is going to be talented as well. So it's always good starting off with that. Um, but I think going into a competition, I always just try and, as Joe said, strip it right down. And I do this sport because I love it. And as long as I'm enjoying myself, I always perform a lot better. So if I'm ever going into a high pressurized situation, I just try and think I'm here because I love this. I'm going to do my best. And I always seem to do a lot better than going into something thinking crisis is so important and I really need to do well here. Mm. I think it's important just to um, go back right back to basics and think I'm here because I love it and um, I'm going to do my best and just try and be really positive about the situation. So I think that's how I would go into something important with my mindset. Well, it's good to see there's a lot of similarities that you, now, isn't it? Oh, sorry, No, go on, Paul. <laughs> yeah, sorry, just something that, that I picked up from, from uh, what both of you really were saying there before, where you said about coming from the Isle of Man, being, you know, little old Isle of Man. Was there anybody locally that you looked up to who paved the way for you to think, you know, I, I can't, I'm not going to be limited by where I'm from, um, have somebody else has, has done that or somebody in, maybe in your own sport or another sport? I mean, if you look at the likes of um, Mark Cavendish, he's such a great example. He's, you know, he's gone from the, from the very bottom as a, a young athlete and he's worked his way all the way up to the top and he's been such an amazing ambassador for the Isle of Man and um, I think everyone sort of opened their eyes now and thought, wow, you know, the Isle of Man produces some amazing talent and not just in cycling, I mean, athletics and um, motorbikes, um, all sorts. So it's, it's amazing now that we've sort of put ourselves on the map a bit. I guess for me, um, I probably didn't have a particular role model. It was just, I, I, I feel really lucky that when I came to, into athletics and started taking it seriously there was a real real good group of people um who i used to train with be surrounded by and go on trips with so the likes of i remember the first time i went away i was with um hannah riley and tom riley used to be down at the track all the time so i always had people who've been successful at island games particularly to look up to and then i remember my first real um best memory that I had in athletics as a youngster was going to the Bermuda Island Games and like that trip there's so many inspiring performances I remember Alan won the steeplechase and it was just that sense of like oh Alan had come from you know just being a guy who would go out run a couple of times a week to seeing someone else win a gold medal and I just felt really lucky to be around those type of people and you just think oh if we all can go through this journey together then there's no stopping what we can do. So, so many of us had come from just, you know, amateur athletics backgrounds to winning international medals that I just felt, yeah, really inspired by the people that I was with. So I think that's what I take most from um, growing up on the Isle of Man, just the people that I was surrounded by. It's quite special, that, uh, that, that games mentality, isn't it, when you've got yeah. a team of people, and especially with athletics, it's an individual sport. But you're all coming together and you sort of enjoy each other's successes massively, don't you? And you all buzz off each other. Uh, yeah, so that was the feeling I got in Ireland Games. And I was never a medalist, but that, uh, that feeling, it's, it's, it's really uh, it's, it's contagious, isn't it? 
Oh, I, I Bermuda is still to date one of the best memories I've got in athletics. I kind of went there, <laughs> probably didn't appreciate actually how nice Bermuda was. I didn't realise that Island Games weren't in place like that every other year. <laughs> so probably took it for granted a bit. But yeah, like I I was doing 400 then and I won the gold medal. And I remember that feeling that I got a couple of pictures actually. And I think it's the only time after a race that I've ever like... <laughs> Because I always grew up watching football and I just would love to like celebrate goals. And I celebrated winning that gold medal like I'd just scored a hat-trick at Wembley in the FA Cup final. <laughs> so, and I was so buzzed across the line. Never, ever forget that. So, yeah, that's yeah, still to date one of the best memories I've got. And, yeah, I think well, a lot of them that I've got will always be um, in an Isle of Man best. But that's, yeah, that's up there still, all the way from seven years ago. Well, being an Everton fan, I suppose you've got to hold on to these successes as well, haven't you? Because you might not yeah, get to feel that watching them. The blue Easy trip. Yeah. <laughs> well, sorry, Paul, you're a blue as well, aren't you? <laughs> um, just one thing I'm, uh, I just want to ask uh, Yasmin. Obviously, with, with your sport not being uh, in a sort of an Island Games sport, um, what's, what's the pinnacle of, of, of your sport in that sort of I say island mentality. Is there any sort of um, events that go on that are akin to the, the island games that people may not know about that you partake in? Well, it's quite difficult because obviously um, my sport isn't involved in sort of, as you say, the normal island games um, competition. So I think as a kid growing up, I was always watching um, badminton and burley on on the on the television and kind of looking up all, to all the riders competing there and that's sort of um the pinnacle of my sport um in general really so i think um having to you know that's same for all questions on the island that um you know they watch badminton and burley every year it's like tradition so um i think that would be what i what i looked up to as a child okay. So badminton, I mean, uh, I've I've had the pleasure of watching badminton a couple of times because my my wife's uh, she she's into a question sport and uh, it, it's proper demanding sport. I mean, credit to you guys and very very dangerous. Uh, I mean, you alluded to, to to a bit of a setback that you had, Yaz, didn't you, uh, in twenty nineteen? I mean, can you give us a little bit of background in, in, into your injury and and sort of how you fought back from that? Yeah, um, it was all going a bit well, to be honest, as it always does. And, you know, you're kind of flying high and then all of a sudden you come crashing back down to earth again. So um, I was competing in a senior trial for the European Championships, the Senior European Championships. And um, I was actually in the lead going into the cross country of this final trial. And I had to come back from the cross country with less than six time penalties. So obviously you've, you've got an optimum time to reach and for every second you go over the time, you get 0 0.4 of a penalty. So um, I had to sort of get my foot down a bit to make sure that I was there or thereabouts on the optimum. And I remember coming into this fence and it was a bit of a do or die, <laughs> you know, as you've got to take the risk sometimes. And I went for it and it, it didn't quite pull through um, and basically landed on my head um and sort of crushed my neck in a really awkward position um i managed to walk away from it managed to get up and i was checked for um concussion at the site before i was able to leave and stuff and i had to go in the ambulance and they had a bit of a prod and poke um but obviously you can't really do much more than than that you've got to kind of make the decision where if, if you to go in the ambulance or if you go home and sort it out yourself so um, to be honest, I thought I was just a bit battered and bruised. So I continued on. I had another really important event coming up that weekend. Um, so I ended up competing in that and was in quite a lot of pain. And as soon as I returned back from the following weekend, I thought, actually, I don't think this is a good idea. I should probably go and get myself checked out. And my physio recommended I go and get an MRI scan and um the results from the MRI scan showed two hairline fractures in T4 and T5 and the thoracic spine. So um, I was really lucky that they weren't displaced or anything. They were simply just yeah. a hairline fracture. So they were stable. Um, I think if they were displaced, obviously I'd have been in a lot more pain and it would have been a not a very good outcome for going forward. 
Um, so I just had to really take it easy for six weeks. Um, I said to the doctor, I really wanted to get back for the final few events of the season. And obviously he was, he wasn't telling me that was a good idea, but you know, <laughs> he said, just try and not fall off. Okay. Like it's, you know, it's not ideal. <laughs> So um, with lots and lots of physio, um, strength and conditioning, I managed to get myself back up and fit for the last few events of the season and just had to obviously be extremely careful. But again, there's only a certain amount in your control that you can do that. So yeah. um, I was quite lucky with the fall anyway. Crikey, very, very lucky. And, you know, and, and credit to you, you what, what a tough cookie to, to want to come back and, and get straight back on the horse and, and, and get straight back competing again even before you knew you'd broken anything as well and you were competing with, with that, with those fractures. Yeah, uh, I definitely, um, I would definitely never do that again. I think I've learned a huge lesson that mm -hmm. if I have a fall, I just need to be a bit more selfish and maybe just actually say, look, we need to maybe just take a step back and yeah. go and get checked out before we sort of plow on like I did. I just need to maybe not be so like <laughs> determined and, <laughs> You know, but you know, you learn something every time. So yeah, I, I, I can relate to that mentality. It's like the mentality of a rugby player who's, who's got an injury and he, he just wants to play the game next week. Well, he doesn't want to be told he can't play. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, can't see. I mean, and Joe, have you had what sort of setbacks have you had along the way? Have you had any major injuries or things like that that you've had to sort of really test your character and your resilience to get back on the track? Um. I guess it's the same in most sports. You get you, you get injuries quite frequently, especially in athletics. I've only ever really had two um, bad ones. I had a hamstring tear in 2015, um, which that was my first proper injury. So you, you feel like you're invincible a bit then. I probably didn't rehab it and manage it as well as I should have, which I later paid for in the following years. As I never tore it to the same extent again, but I kept having little tweaks of it and then I, I I feel like I've managed my body quite well um obviously since I've gone up to the 800 the demands of that event are different so I've started you know going out for more runs and stuff and this year was the first year that maybe um I saw that effect on my body I had a foot injury um just a tight uh planter which meant that I didn't um step foot on a track for about it was about seven weeks mm -hmm. in the end I was still able to train and do other things but yeah I was seven weeks not wearing spikes and not being on a track but yeah mm -hmm. that was from January to March this year which you know it really makes you appreciate the sport and not take things for granted so when I was able to get back and run on a track I had such a smile on my face every time I was doing that this year and then even being back now just training I feel like since March through to now, I've been able to just really enjoy running for what it is, you know, going out and testing yourself, seeing yourself get fitter, just enjoying that, the simplicity of athletics and running and sprinting. So, yeah, I think those are the two main injuries that I've had and I've definitely learned a lot from each of them. But touch wood, everything's fine at the minute and I yeah. hope it stays like that. Absolutely. I mean, in terms of setbacks, I mean, setbacks is, is everyone's guaranteed to have a setback in sport, aren't they, at some point? Uh, and, and, and how you deal with that often shapes the, your future successes. But uh, you've also got uh, people who are helping you along the way, so it's probably a pertinent time to talk about, about that. I mean, what, what sort of support networks have you guys got around you that enable you to, to sort of do your sport, and especially at the level you, you're doing it at? I've had I've had a really good support network for a really long time now. I mean, I I spoke about Bermuda before, and I'd say pretty much since then um, up to now, I've had a lot of people who have fought my corner for a long time. Even before then, I remember still when I was a kid, um, I ended up not having a coach for a bit. You know, I just got into athletics and started taking it seriously. You know, training um, three or four times a week, and I didn't have a coach that year going into Bermuda. So Anthony Brand um, took me on and he used to come down to the track with me on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I think. And he would literally, any weather, um, any time of year, just stand there with a stopwatch and just shout out times for me. So he was the first person that probably um, really helped me in that sense. And then everyone at Sport Aid has 
always been uh, very backing of me. Andy in the gym, literally for seven, eight years, has wrote my programs, and um, he's always been there for me to talk to and um, discuss why we are doing some things, why we aren't doing others, and that's really helped me because I'm an athlete who quite likes to understand why I do things, not just that I need to do it. I like to know why, why it's going to benefit me and stuff. So he's been really good for that. And then obviously all the guys in the office as well, Paul and Chris has always helped me with anything that I need, questions that I've got to ask if I ever um, had any specific requests, things like that. And then, yeah, sponsors, I've been really lucky with who I've had on. So obviously Isle of Man Sport Aid and the Albert Goube Foundation have been uh, very supportive of me especially last year or so which I think was why 2019 was such a good year for me um and then private sponsors I've had uh Suji at TLC Business Solutions she's been with me for two years now and again she's brilliant she just stays in touch she's anything that I need she'll she'll support me like no end uh have me around for tea and coffee in her office and just, again it's nice to have someone like that from a different a different perspective obviously she's not involved in sport so she can help me from a business perspective as yeah. well and say how she's been successful in a business she can help and relay certain things to me in a sporting sense and say mm-hmm. have you considered adopting this approach in a certain way and things like that and again just having that person to talk to has been yeah. brilliant for me sometimes like you say in elite sport you work yourself up and think about things so much and then you talk with someone who's not from that background and they just strip things down simply and you think oh I'm overcomplicating things and things like that and then uh, Satanta Hypnotherapy Clinic have supported me this year as well financially which has made such a difference you know I've been able to um, edge more towards that full-time athlete life which makes such a difference you know you I haven't had to work as much so those hours that I'd have spent working i can spend actually recovering properly now um i've got more money for things like physio sessions trips away things like that so yeah the support that i've had and especially from people on the isle man for a lot of years now has been absolutely amazing fantastic so just tapping into what you said there um joe we'll, we'll change it switch it over to uh yasmin um obviously yeah you're on island at the moment joe um i know you you, you have been away in, in cardiff and came back just before lockdown Yasmin, you're currently still in the UK and have been based there for, for how long now? And if you want to explain a little bit about what, what, what you're doing, where you're based and things like that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I moved away from the Isle of Man when I was 16. Um, I just left school and I, I had this conversation with my mum. I either continued to do school and go through sixth form and then obviously on to either university or college. And mum said to me that I'd already... Um, won double gold at the European Championships when I was 16. Um, she said to me, "If you if you really want to do this, you know now's the time to really take it up and move across and try and make it happen." Um, and it was kind of a bit of luck, really, that um, it all fell into place. Um, I'm currently supported by Sue Davies and Jeanette Chin, and I'm based at their uh, stud yard in Cheshire, um, and I ride to their horses as well. So really without them I wouldn't actually be doing what I'm doing so um, for them to especially be from the Isle of Man as well that they're supporting a Manx girl and trying to you know help her achieve a goal of going to the Olympics and you know winning a gold medal I think is really special so um, I definitely think a lot of this is down to um, obviously luck has got to play a huge part in it Um, results and dedication Um, I kind of came here as a young girl and Sue obviously didn't want to just hand it to me all on a plate almost. I had to work my way up and prove to her that I wanted it and I was dedicated, determined um, for what I wanted. And um, now that she's sort of seen that I'm really wanting to go forward with it, she's supported me 100%. So I'm so grateful for them and what they've done for me as as well as my mom and dad and I think it was the the whole process of um, obviously when I was first accepted onto sport aid, um, I thought, wow, like I've really got to give this a go now. And you've just got to make the most of every opportunity that's thrown at you. Um, so I'm so glad that I've had the support from Isle of Man Sport as well, from 
um, very young age that they've really pushed me and encouraged me to go forward and do what I love. So I'm very, very lucky. Yeah. Um, and that support, so obviously we talked about the support network and what the, the Sport Institute obviously offers. Um, obviously when, when you're back on hand, Yasmin, you can have access to that. And Joe, um, when it reopens, <laughs> you'll obviously, obviously have access to that again. Um, I mean, the one thing, one of the always, uh, story that always sort of stands out to me is uh, Tim Neal, who was our shooter at the, the, the Olympics, um, who prior to the Olympics um, decided that he wanted to take some of our Sport Institute staff over to uh, where he was training in the UK. I believe uh, our host for today, Trevor, was part of that team to go and help him prepare for the Olympics. Um, and I don't know, just we'll throw it to you, Trevor, actually. Um, so why do you think that was that, that, that he wanted to have you know, local Isle of Man based uh, support team around him at that point? Uh, well, I think a lot of it's down to relationships and, and Tim had already uh, developed a lot of those relationships over the years, uh, especially with Ruth Cool, his physio. Uh, so she, I, I'm with myself providing some strength and conditioning support. I think uh, having that p people you know and trust can make a big difference. Uh, so I think that's possibly a, a big reason behind Tim's uh, decision to try and stick with us because obviously he had uh, he had access to things like EIS as well and their strength and conditioning teams and uh, I think he was getting psychology support as well from from EIS so he, he was getting a mixture of uh, some support from from the UK but he, he was being a really proud manxman he, he absolutely loved working with with Alman Sport and, and and having that wider network with with, with home really because I think even though he lives in the UK, I think he still considers the Isle of Man as, as, as home in, in a lot of respects. So just for you two, when you go to the Olympics, Trevor would like to uh, to help you out there. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Top support team. <laughs> before, before we move on, something I wanted to ask, uh, this was a Joe, uh, looking at your interview with the, when you received the award, for Sportsman of the Year, you alluded to uh, a period where things weren't going quite so well for you, and perhaps you were struggling. And you, you made reference to that, you know, it was really good that you were still getting support from, you know, Alaman Sport and various other sponsors during that time. And I suppose the question I was going to ask was, e even though things might have not been going quite so good for you, what, why do you think people stuck with you? What sort of behaviours and attributes do you think you you perhaps had um, that? that made I th that support stick? I think I, I, I was very thankful because, I mean, like, yeah, like you said, things weren't going bad, but I felt like I wasn't, there was a couple of years, maybe two or three years where I didn't quite progress as quickly as I'd have liked to. And I felt like, I felt like maybe if I, if I hadn't have been from the Isle of Man and I'd just been from somewhere in England where, you know, there's going to be loads of people that come come and go through these kind of um, academy things that I could have just been let through the door and then I think, oh, in three years' time, you know, we're going to have another Joe and we're better off putting all our eggs in his basket. But I felt like because I was from here, like Ironman Sport Aid really looked after what was like the Manx talent that they had. And I, I'd have liked to think that they could have seen that, you know, I was from a young age, I've been trying to do everything the right way. I've been trying to live the right lifestyle. Um, I've been trying to do the right things within athletics that, you know, would have got us to the point where we are now, where I can say, I'm, um, you know, developing into one of the top seniors. And I just felt, yeah, like I said, maybe if I hadn't been from the Isle of Man and I hadn't been able to um, communicate on a personal level with the likes of Chris, Paul, yourself, that maybe I could have just been another, um, another young athlete who slipped through the net and wasn't doing sport by the age of 23, 24. So yeah, I'll always look back on that period of my career and think I was lucky to have such a supportive network around me because uh, who knows if, if I wasn't, if I wasn't Manx um, and you were somewhere else in the UK, would you have just slipped through the net? I think the answer mm -hmm. in, in some cases is quite often yes. Yes, I mean, you've obviously been on Sport Aid for um, a, a number of years as well now. Every time that the uh, the application process comes around every year, do you ever do you ever feel that you need to, uh, you know, let us know exactly what you've been doing? Are you, are you ever worried that you know somebody might think one year wasn't as good as the previous year? And 
tell us a bit about that yeah I think um obviously I've we've got such high standards and it's a a hugely talented island with so many athletes that are coming up through and you've definitely got to um fight for your place I would say like um it's important to me that I've got the man sport on board and um to represent the Isle of Man is obviously I'm so proud to do that so um having having Isle of Man sport on board every year is just a real um privilege actually yeah, I'm so happy to be a part of it I think it's uh like you say Joe you you mentioned that in the UK, in those sort of scenarios, you might just be sort of spat out as a number and replaced yeah. by, by by someone else who's coming through the ranks. I think with such a small population on the Isle of Man, we have to really sort of look after our talent pool because it's so yeah, small. Yeah. And it's we're not like China where we've got billions of people who can just re- replace others if, if they get broken. Yeah. So I think that we have to really sort of make sure we're, we're sort of trying to help and nurture people as best as possible through through the hard times as well as the, the good times. Yeah, I guess that's what I've always felt thankful for is that I've never been made to feel like just a number. And yeah, like we said, if you are somewhere else in the world, that might be the case. But I feel like obviously I had a responsibility as an athlete to show that I deserved the the trust and backing of Isle of Man sport. And then I feel like whether it's right or wrong of me to say that Ironman Sport had the the same thing, I feel like they're right to give their own that backing and maybe trust them when things aren't going so well. Because like you said, we haven't got such a big pool over here and you can't really risk people slipping through that net. So I feel like, especially in my case and um, my sister's case as well, that they've really, really supported us. And if we were somewhere else in the world, that probably wouldn't have been the case yet. Yeah. I mean, like, as, as with anything, success isn't always in a straight line, is it? There's, there's always blips along the way and no one's journey is just, you know, straight to the top. Uh, so I think when you have those blips, that, that's a real test of your character as well, isn't it? It's a real test of if you've got those key attributes and behaviours, uh, the, the planning, the organisation, the determination, the resilience to, to try and get through those hard times and, I think you guys have got those behaviours and attributes in spades and I think uh, it really shows. I think people warm to those attributes as well. I think people want to try and help people who have, have got that determination and have got that, uh, you know, they, they understand their goals and where they want to go. So, you know, it's great to see that. I mean, Yaz, you know, you, you've got one big hairy ass goal there of becoming an Olympic gold medalist. That's fantastic having that hairy ass goal is, is, is what drives you, isn't it? And it's then breaking it down into all the smaller ones that are going to help you get there eventually. And You've never I, made the fix seem so unappealing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, blame Paul Jones for that. I, I, I've took that uh, phrase from him. Big, have big, <laughs> encouraging the young guys in the, the academy to have a big hairy ass goal because there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. I'm just I'm just trying to work out how you're gonna dub over something different over the top of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll I'll um, try something, but I might have to just go in and cut. <laughs> um th- well that leads into something that I wanted to just dis- you wanted to you you t- you two guys to discuss over is the fact that um obviously when, when people see you in uh, the Alman newspapers or hear hear about you on Manch Radio or, or other radio stations and media outlets as uh, Yasmin Ingham, our sports star, and Joe Reed, our sports star, that, that it, we at Sport, I don't know when we're looking at these things, and the committee always look at this, is the person behind the, the athlete, uh, not just creating good, good athletes, but also creating good people um, and forging those relationships, I think you both touched on with when talking about sponsors. Um, can you talk a little bit to, uh, about you as, as a person, maybe, um, and so, so the people who are listening to this can, and get a feel of who is Yasmin Ingham, who is Joe Reed when you strip away the uh, the, the sporting attributes. Yeah, I mean that's like it's it's almost a difficult question because I feel like um, not my I I've done my sport for so long, so I almost couldn't imagine myself not being involved in my sport, which is really strange. Um, but I think a huge part of how I've grown up as a person 
Um, moving away from home at 16 was obviously a really um, tough change um, from, you know, living with mum and dad and my brother. I was sort of kind of thrown into the deep end a bit. I was um, riding for um, very high profile people um, who owned the horses for me. Um, I had to have regular meetings with them. So I was kind of had to really grow up quite fast um, and be quite mature. So I think having so much life experience with um, just kind of been having to get on with it a little bit and not being like Molly Cuddle, I think that's definitely made me a much more confident person. Um, I feel like I could um, sort of go out and just have like a really strong conversation with someone that I was a bit like nervous of maybe speaking to or something like that because I've been in that situation before. So um, I definitely think um, moving away to, you know, continue with my sport, that's kind of made me a much stronger person. And Joe, what, what, what do you think um, as, as Joe the person as opposed to Joe the uh, superstars in you know, wrestling? Superstar. <laughs> um, I, I, to be honest, I, I just think I'm a pretty normal 24-year-old, to be honest. It, <laughs> apart from the fact that I run 800 metres quite fast, that I, there's not much different about me to, I'd say, the majority of 24-year-old lads on the Isle of Man. I, you know, grew up over here. I just used to want to play with my mates all the time and have a laugh. Uh, went to uni, made some really good friends there, and I was really glad that I had that uni experience the only difference for me that was where the boys that I lived with would go out five times a week I'd maybe go out twice a year or something like that um, um but yeah like I I feel like I'm I'm very social I like uh, when I can switch off on my sport I like just family time and time with my mates and um, just real simple things that everyone else like I mean um in off in off season, I probably live live the life that any anyone anyone else um, around my age on the island does. You know, um, socialising. Um, even yeah, in off season, I don't mind going down to the pub on the weekend, um, having a couple, and you know, just living like a normal life. Like Yaz will know the same. We live such intense lifestyles normally trying to achieve everything in your sport that when you get that time to switch off, it's really nice. And I quite like to make the most of that and just feel like, um, you know, not an athlete for a bit. And do you think, uh, because both of you said quite similar sort of things and the fact that you're not, maybe not that different from the athlete to the person. Do you think that's, that's been a major benefit for why you are so successful up to this point and how, you, how you've done in your sport is the fact that you can a transition isn't so great from being a, a personality to being a an athlete maybe yeah i guess i i feel like there are certain certain elements of my personality that help me in my sport but then pers- there are certain elements that i'd have to take away i mean i'd say aside from athletics i'm actually probably quite lazy um a lot of the a lot of the traits that I have in my life I'm very lazy with you know I don't have much urgency about things I'm very laid back but when it comes to athletics I'm very switched on I know what I do and don't have to do and I know when and when I do and don't have to do things um I think the most important thing is just being able to strike that balance of knowing what the good good things are about you and your personality that will help you in your sport and then knowing knowing the things that you have to turn the switch on and say, no, I can't let that carry over into my professional career because I need to be better at that. I think that's the main thing that I've learned about the personality between me as um, just a normal member of society and then me as 800 metre athlete. Something I I think we want to move on to, guys, is uh, the current situation we're in at the moment. And we've talked a lot about our sort of backgrounds 2019 the successes we talked about injuries and setbacks there we're, we've now got a, a global pandemic with COVID-19 and that's a big setback for everyone and can you guys give us a little bit of uh, information around how, how that's affecting you at the minute and how you're sort of uh, I suppose approaching that challenge of, uh, of lockdown and, and not being able to do what you would normally do 
I think like obviously it's a huge change to what the norm is around this time of year like my season starts from March till October so obviously we'd be on the run up to our major three-day events which run sort of end of May beginning of June so we'd be sort of making our final preparations for all these big events and it's just really strange that this you know this has happened it's absolutely crazy you couldn't really have written it to be honest um but I think um I'm quite lucky I'm based here in Cheshire I'm on site with the horses so not a huge amount changes for me in the fact that I can still train I can still do things with the horses maybe not quite to the level of what I would like to be doing um the our federation has asked us to just scale it down for now just until um you know, obviously we're trying to protect the NHS we don't want to be doing anything dangerous that could um potentially hinder them so um yeah we're just continuing training um as I said before working on my weaknesses now it's a great time to do that so um I just hope that we can sort of get back to some sort of normality soon absolutely and uh I mean approach wise for you Joe I mean what uh, you would normally be in Cardiff you're in the Isle of Man at the moment is that right yeah, um, I live live in Cardiff with my girlfriend. We just have a one bed flat there, and we felt like it was a sensible decision to come back. You know, have the support of our families and stuff around us. So we came back, and um, although like yeah, as I can still I can still train pretty normally. I just have to adapt some of my sessions. Obviously, I don't have a track or a gym at the minute. Yeah. Um, so I'm doing a lot of my sessions running on um, football pitches, golf courses hills beaches um think yeah i've just had to adapt it and then you know i've picked up a few things that i can kind of use to make a home gym so my garage is a bit of a mess at the minute we've got bars and weights and kettlebells and skipping ropes and stuff in there but yeah i'm still able to follow my structural training routine that i would i've just had to adapt it slightly and to be honest i i feel like I'm going to come out of this fitter and stronger than I went into it. Obviously, I had that foot injury that lasted till March, so I actually feel like now I'm I'm in quite good shape in comparison to what I was then. Yeah, I mean, have you both found? Sorry, no, go on, Paul. I was going to say, have you both found um, this this time when not everybody will be ramping up their training, um, so you can afford to just keep things ticking over? Have you found this has given you the time to do things that maybe? you wouldn't normally have been able to do. Definitely, yeah. I think um, it's always important to um, try and keep your sponsors in the loop and maybe do some extra things for your sponsors that you wouldn't usually have time to do during the season. Um, there's one thing that I'm getting involved in at the minute um, is a big charity fundraiser for um, some of the NHS charities and I've actually chosen Isle of Man Hospice um, as my ch chosen charity um, and it's event going on. It starts today, actually. It's called the Virtual Eventing and um, it's been created um, basically as we are trying to replicate doing a three day event, but at home and it's going to be live streamed on Facebook and um, just trying to raise as much money for charity as possible. So. I'm really excited to be involved in that and um, there's many other top riders that are also involved and lots of my sponsors are getting on, on board as well so trying to um, get everybody together in a, a bit of an awful time really and try and make something good out of it so that's fantastic yeah I mean there's a lot of fundraising taking place at the moment as well isn't there and it's, it's great to see people really appreciate the the services that like the NHS uh, that are really helping us through this difficult time as well. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, and Joe, I mean, what, what about yourself? Any any things you wouldn't normally be doing that it allows you to do? Um, the the one the one thing I have done is I've always been conscious that you know, as a as a sportsman, it's a very short term career, and there's going to be a point where I can't I can't do it as competitively as I'd like to anymore. So I've kind of thought about what I'd like to do after and I've started um, practicing writing. I'd all, I did my degree in sport and social sciences and I'd love to go into sport after this and sport journalism is something that I'd consider. So I've practiced a bit of writing because normally, you know, it's, um, I wouldn't have time to do it. I've, I concentrate on other things, you know, I, I train, I recover, I work. So it's given me a bit more time to, 
concentrate on maybe what life would look like after and then just simple things as well really I mean obviously I, I'm not normally around my family and it's been lovely to be home and spend time with them and just really strip things back and realize what you do and don't enjoy and I think once once life does get back to normal it's important for not just me but everyone to recognize what they've really enjoyed during this time because things are in a way so simplistic now that anything that you enjoy now you should really try hard to keep in once things get back to normal you don't just want to settle back into the same routine that you had I think if you've got something if you found something that you really enjoy doing now it's important to keep that in so what we're saying is at the end of your career then Joe you're going to be more of a John Watson than a JK Rowling <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm not quite that good yet but that'd be the plan <laughs> you have to have a Zoom meeting with John Watty then and have a brew with him and get some top tips. <clears throat> Excellent. Uh, I'm just kind of looking through my little notes now and seeing what other sort of questions we've got. But we, we've, got, we've covered loads of stuff there. I mean, that's been really yeah. interesting. Uh, it's been great to hear what you guys have been getting up to and, and sort of how you're sort of dealing with things. Uh, are you still sane through COVID at the moment? Still positive and upbeat and raring to go? Yeah, to, to be, I've, Sorry, I've, not that I've enjoyed it. I mean, obviously, there's people that are really struggling and losing family members and stuff. So it's horrible to say that. But I mean, at the same time, it's been it's been quite nice to have just had this simplicity put back in. You know, I think everyone and I've been guilty of getting um, you know caught up, and you you think that life's hundred miles per hour, and now that it's like slow down, you can see things what they are. I I. I quite in, I've quite enjoyed having that dis- different perspective, I think. Yeah, I would actually totally agree with you, Joe. It's been nice to um, just slow down a bit and actually enjoy um, just a bit of normality as well. No, I totally agree with what you, what you guys are saying. You, you mentioned being stripped back. I think it is. It's got back to the core values of, of, of people, really. Um, so when we take we stop sport and it was the same for everybody it's not like some sports have been you know carrying on through all this everybody's on it's a level playing field now and a bit like when everybody gets back it probably will be a bit more of a level playing field but the simplicity of sitting down to have a family meal and things like that is is something i think that we've we've always taken for granted and we thought we've never had time to do it and all these things that we never had time to do we're actually you know we've got that time to do it and i think it will so we'll come out of this with the, the new normal uh, looking something uh, a lot different from what we're actually we, we think. And um, one thing I did want to ask you guys is: so in the evenings, um, are we are we Netflixing? Are we Amazon Prime? Are we Disney Plusing? <laughs> what's what's your recommendation for to get you through? Um, I think. I mean, I'm I'm all, I'm sent, I'm sort of gutted that I can't be at home. Obviously, whilst there's no eventing going on, as I do spend most of my time over here and checking with the horses. So obviously when there's no events on, I almost kind of want to be at home. Um, but I need to continue to train with the horses. So hopefully I'll be able to get home when um, obviously the borders reopen and everything sort of softens down a bit. So um, I'm lucky that I, I live over here with my boyfriend, Jamie. So um, in the evenings, we'd probably watch a bit of Netflix. Um, he takes got- me on cycles and stuff like that we've got we've got some bikes so we go on a couple of cycles and um just try and keep busy really um and it, what are you watching at the moment then what what recommendation on uh, netflix is there oh god honestly i i think i've almost completed like every series i'm such <laughs> a netflix binger it's really embarrassing so um, we've been through tiger king then have we <laughs> do you know what that's the one thing i haven't watched would you recommend it <laughs> compelling viewing yeah <laughs> Joe, what, what about you? I completed Tiger King about four weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've um, I've watched a lot of Netflix. Uh, I finished Tiger King. I watched a new season of Ozark. Um, I've just started re-watching The Office again, The American Office. That's on Prime. That's brilliant for anyone who hasn't watched it. And then I've been playing a lot of Football Manager as well. <laughs> I got, I got to 2033 with Peterborough and I went unbeaten in the league, won the Champions League, the FA Cup, the League Cup and the Community Shield. So that's my point. 
Carlo okay. Ancelotti must be shaking in his boots then. I know. I get my applications in as soon as this is off to be a real football manager. <laughs> well, are you, Paul? What are your Netflix favourites today? <laughs> uh, I've been watching some uh, Ted Bundy. Uh, <laughs> oh, my life. At the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so I just got through the Extremely Wicked um, film and there's a couple of things that I've been watching on that. But yeah, was, other than that, it's just it's actually been sort of taken... A bit like we said before, taking the time to watch something you wouldn't maybe normally yeah. watch, um, and trying to find find different things. So it's been, it's been interesting. No, I've I've got the Ted Bundy tapes on my watch list <laughs> to watch at some point. Uh, I've been watching a bit of Luther at the minute as well, which is really oh, gross. Proper scary <laughs> ones in that as well. Because what, what what makes it scary is that there might be actually people like that in the world. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, nostalgia, I, I, I'm going back through, as you know, Paul, back through Night Rider at the minute with, with, with the Hoff. So, <laughs> so that's been a, a little good nostalgia trip for me. Mm. That's been good. All right, we'll probably close that there, guys. We've been going for a good hour. Uh, <clears throat> so this will, we'll get this out as soon as we can so people can enjoy listening to your stories. And really... Big, big, big thank you to both of you for, for giving up your time and, and coming to speak to us. So, Pleasure. on behalf of like Alaman Sport and hopefully the Alaman community, we wish you well through COVID and all the best for, for when sport kicks off again. Uh, go out there and smash it, guys. Will do. Thank you. Thanks, well done, guys. Thanks, Paul, for, for coming in and co-hosting with me today. It's been brilliant and it's been quite nice actually uh, bouncing the questions between the two of us. So, We'll have to get you I'll back be on for the, next the call one. for the next one, yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> mate. <laughs> okay, so guys, stay safe, uh, wash your hands, and uh, we'll catch up with you again soon. See you later. Cool, nice. thanks. Bye. Bye.